Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Blue Screen Podcast. I am your host, Jason, and I am joined today by my co-host. Hi, I'm like Derek. By Derek. He's a little bit shy. Please, please be gentle with him. Uh, and basically, uh, this is a general gaming podcast where we will talk about basically anything and everything gaming. We kind of go by the motto that we'll say gaming is sort of timeless. So we're, you're going to be seeing or hearing rather new stuff, old stuff, uh, obscure stuff, whatever we feel like talking about. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what we're doing. So, uh, Derek, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Fantastic. I feel like we've done this before. I feel like we've done this many times. Yes, I I, I don't know why we would get that impression. It's, yeah. it's almost as if we've, this is we've like, screwed up a bunch of times before this. Yeah. Let's, like, get on with it. Man. All right, well, let's get let's on get with on it. Let's get on with it. So, uh, what have, uh, have you been playing anything uh, good recently? Good. Yes, I have been playing a good game, a very good game that nobody has ever heard of. What is this good game? This game is called Logic Pro 2. Logic Pro 2. So you've been using an audio editor. Dude, you have no clue how satisfying it is to move those bars around. <laughs> I, I think I have a bit of an idea. Uh, but no, seriously, um, from what I understand, Logic Pro 2 is actually a game. So can you tell us a little bit about that, what that is? Sure. Uh, basically, this company in Korea, South Korea, uh, Denium, decided, hey, we're going to like make arcade games. And they made, they made a, a very interesting one. If, are you familiar with Picross? Uh, I am familiar with Picross, yes. Picross is like one of those games where you got to draw a picture. You got like a grid, and you got to draw a picture by using number hints on the side. It's kind of like Sudoku, kind of. But, um, yeah, basically, they took that simple puzzle, and they made it into an arcade game with a time limit, two-player co-op, and the occasional enemy that comes on the board that tries to mess up, you know, your markers. So, it's actually a really neat game. It's got, like, power-ups and stuff, and... Nobody knows about it because it was Korean, but and and what yeah. do you uh, what is what is this what system like is this oh, available it's, on? It's a it, it's an exclusive to arcade. Okay, I actually bought the arcade board for fifteen bucks. Like it's very cheap game, so if you have the means to play it, it's like I would highly recommend it. But uh, there was a PlayStation version also of the sequel, but that was a rushed port. Don't don't get that one. Get the original number two. It's pretty good. For the, for the, uh, basically yeah. the arcade board. Yeah, the arcade board. I, I would imagine that being kind of uh, like a nightmare. Like, uh, you said it's like Picross. Like, is it, yeah. how close is it to Picross? It is Picross. Oh, so it's, it's basically it, it it's arcade Picross. It is arcade Picross. I could see that being nightmarish because yeah. um, from what you said, um, I don't remember if you just said now or just, uh, uh, earlier, you said that there was enemies, right? So yes. So uh, these, these enemies, uh, what exactly do they do? So basically Picross, the way it works is, it's kind of like Minesweeper, where you could flag a, flag a square for later. So, you, like, you know, you look at the hints, you're like, oh, this is a square I should not hit. So then you hit those squares around it. These enemies, sometimes they'll actually place markers without you noticing, or they'll remove markers off the screen. So you have to constantly keep tabs on them. And uh, I've screwed up many times because I thought I was safe and I smacked down. And every time you, you get a wrong square, it takes time off your timer. Lovely. Yeah, so it, it's a very tense game, and sometimes uh, you'll even get like the occasional enemy too that'll actually like move back and forth on the screen, and they'll kind of attack your cursor too. <laughs> so, like your your cursor is like a weapon, but if it gets attacked, it also takes off time. So there's a little bit of actually attacking back the enemy. So it's like an action pick Ross game. This, this sounds nightmarish, like in in, in a oh, good way. It, it is. Like later on, it gets absolutely ridiculous. Like by stage 10, because I think it's a 15 stage game, but stage 10, it's a 20 by 20 grid. And there's like at least 20 enemies just jumping around all over the place, just placing and moving markers. Like you can't even rely anymore on your markers. Like you have to actually just start straight. Okay, these are my hints. I'm just going to work one line at a time. And you have to complete this entire puzzle within... What, what, what kind of time frames are they giving you for this? Uh, I like to crank the difficulty, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, the game actually allows you to set how long the timer is, so if you put, put it on the very easiest difficulty level, like, you get so much time that it's pretty much not even an issue. Like, as long as you're breaking blocks, you could actually play it casually. Oh, but cool. on the fastest settings, you've got... You're dead in, like, a minute. 
That that's actually that's actually awesome because um, like I enjoy I enjoy Picross. I like oh, yeah. playing it on like my, my, my 3DS there. It, it's and, probably my favorite puzzle game. Yeah, it's actually really good. I like it. And uh, but you know I like playing it casually. I like just sitting back. Yeah. But you know every once in a while you're kind of sitting there. You get frustrated with a puzzle. I think it would be kind of fun to. Will say frustrate yourself even more by adding an extra element to the game where you're just like get out of the way. Yep, yep, uh, that's but, exactly it. But in a way, it mixes things up, and I I can see how it would actually make things kind of fresh. And yeah. I I like the yeah. uh, I like that you pointed out that there's uh, multiple difficulty levels, so yeah. you kind of get to pick your poison. You want yeah. you'd be tearing your hair out, or you want to just sort of sit back and have a, an interesting game of a unique game of yeah. uh, Picross. Well, even if you like put it on the easiest difficulty level, because there's two difficulty settings, you could also like remove enemies altogether too if you just want super casual. I, I, and that's well, I was gonna say that's sort of the the, the joy of we'll say arcade games is a lot of uh, was that like dip switch stuff and a lot of oh, yeah. uh, a lot of options. Uh, and I was gonna say, well, you know, consoles do have options, but you know what? Uh, for the most part, I don't find a lot of console games have too many options like that for you. It it depends really. Like faithful arcade ports usually will, but sometimes they'll hide away some of the harder stuff just because they want you like practicing at home and demolishing the game. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I never never thought about that. That arcade ports would deliberately be made easier so yeah. you couldn't ah so you couldn't game the system. Yep. Awesome. That's a thing. That's a thing. All right. Well, that that's cool. And uh, sorry, the name of that game that was Logic Pro Two. Yep. By Denium. By Denium. All right, uh, and um, I'll see if I can maybe put. Uh, I'll I'll put the names of uh, the games we talk about here in like a uh, description or show notes or something, and we'll I'll make it visible. We will be able to find it. Okay. So I also <coughs> understand you have been playing some games that are not so good. Yeah. He doesn't want to talk about them. <laughs> He's like, okay. He's silence. Like, nope. Uh, well, 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 why don't you talk about a game first? Like, all right. We'll, we'll go back and forth. Um, all right. Well, let's see. What have I... Well, just the... Uh, yesterday. I... Uh, actually, it wasn't just yesterday. It was, it's been over the course of a little while. But I've been playing uh, King's Quest Three, And okay. that's an old uh, Sierra adventure game with the parser. And um, it was actually the first game I ever recall seeing ever seeing like that's in your f- life in my memory that is the first game i remember seeing that's interesting i didn't even know that and i've known you for 27 years surprise 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 wow. uh but yeah if, if you're not familiar with it uh I, I don't remember what it was that was mid to late 80s i think mid to late 80s um oh is it like the old like cga graphics ega graphics uh, it's, the, it's the ega it's the, EGA. Uh, the agi it's like uh, space quest one looking. okay it's the yeah. police quest one looking. I, I actually don't remember that game at all no no uh okay then i'll go ahead and i'll explain it a little bit uh king's quest three uh, it's basically an adventure game and if you've seen modern adventure games get ready because this one here is going to just throw you for a loop um this game here you start off as gwydion this sort of servant actually you're a slave to this wizard and uh, basically, this wizard is constantly, uh, you know, telling you to go do chores, clean up uh, for him, and stuff like that. You know, it sounds like an exciting game premise, doesn't it? Yeah, it, actually, that does sound pretty cool. <laughs> so you navigate the game with. Um, I, I was playing both the original, and I played. There was actually a remake put out by AGD ADG Interactive, sorry, which has got a more of a point and click interface, a lot of nice quality uh, of life improvements. But I was playing the original as well. And basically, you walk around. I'm going to talk about the original mostly, but you walk around with your keyboard, you know, your arrow keys, uh, and then you type in what you want to do. So if you want to pick up a loaf of bread, you type in like "get bread" or "take bread," and then you get the bread in your inventory. But can you type "eat bread"? You can. I don't know if it actually works though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can type in a lot of things. Uh, there's so many options, and that's one of the reasons I like of these old parser games is. Um, not only are you getting to explore the world, but you can kind of explore what you can do within these worlds. Uh, you know, there's sometimes there's Easter eggs hidden in there, and there's a certain notable one about Space Quest Two, which I'm going to omit right now. But uh, <laughs> there's there's some very fun things that you you can do with the parser. Uh, but anyways, with the game, you're in this house, and then eventually, you know what? You kind of get the idea that maybe you want to escape. Maybe I don't know. If I was trapped by a wizard who told me to do things, I don't know if I'd want to escape because a the wizard's really mean. And B, it's a wizard. That's pretty cool. No, he's a jerk, though. He's a jerk. He's like a jerk wizard. He's a jerk wizard. I don't know. I haven't never seen a jerk wizard in my y- life. You're going to hold judgment until you see him? <clears throat> I'm going to hold judgment because every wizard I've ever, like, went to school with. <laughs> I don't know. 
You, you go to school a lot, with a lot of wizards? Dude, like those math wizards, man. They were the best. Uh, I had a problem. Poof! My question. My answer. Right there. I love wizards. <laughs> I, think, I think we're talking about a slightly different kind of wizard, but... All right. Think of, think of, don't think of these as math wizards. Think of these as chemistry wizards. Chemistry wizards. Ooh, chemistry. Well, actually, chemistry's cool. Never mind. Yeah. These these are the wizards, the kind of wizards that are just like, go empty my chamber pot. You don't want to say it that way. I might bleep it depending on what it is. <clears throat> oh, you're not talking about wizards. You're talking about pizzards. <laughs> That's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and no, I will not do you the, the, the joy of censoring that. <laughs> People are going to hear that stupidity. Yes. <laughs> uh, 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 so anyways, so ultimately the goal is to escape. And then there's, uh, I, I think we can spoil the story at this point. You know, it's, I, I think so too, because I probably have no intention of playing this game, but it does sound interesting. All right. Well, basically, eventually you discover that you're actually Alexander who is a prince of this kingdom called Daventry, who's, you're actually the son of the, the the main protagonist from the first two King's Quest games. And you have to make your way back there. But that that's a, it's, it's a sort of a, a long thing. So anyways, you you have some motivation to, to escape. You don't want to stay with this wizard. He's not your real dad. <laughs> you <know? laughs> you're not my dad. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so what happens is every once in a while, the wizard will go away. He'll go on a journey or he'll go take a nap in his room or something. And while he's sleeping or he's away on a journey is, you know, when you can escape. You you make your way down the mountain that you're, the, his house is on. And then you'll go ahead and you'll start finding items and, a, you know, usual quest stuff. But there's a timer up at the top of the uh, the, the, the screen at all times. And he, the wizard will leave for certain amounts of time each time. So you have to watch the timer and be back before he gets back. Or else okay. if he finds you, he'll punish you and probably kill you. So there's that constant tension. You're like, okay, he's on a journey. Quick, make it down. Do as much as you stuff as you can, and then get back and act like nothing happened. And you have to hide stuff that you, you that you get because if he knows you've left the house, he'll punish you as well. So you're like hiding stuff under your bed, and then eventually you find his spell book. And so while he's leaving, you you're teaching yourself magic and you're preparing spells until eventually you uh, use a spell on him to turn him into a cat. And then, then you can go ahead and get free, and then it goes to the second part of the game where you end up on a pirate ship and dealing with dragons oh, and stuff. That was only the first part of the game? Because if that was the entire game, that actually sounds really cool. It, it, is, it, is, it is most of the game. The, the, the second part is definitely much shorter. The stuff with, like, like I said, the, the pirate ship and the, like the dragon and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, <coughs> it's, a, uh, it, it's cool. I, I, I like it. Uh, I find a lot of adventure games, they get sort of stuck on this linear path of, okay, you go ahead, you get this, this item, yeah. you go solve this, go, solve this. But this here has got this sort of time element where you constantly feel like, okay, I'm, I've got to do something. There's this tension. That actually sounds fantastic. I might actually play that game. Yeah, yeah. actually, that sounds really good. I'm <laughs> going to recommend the remake first. Okay. Um, because even playing the remake, I was going, oh, I can definitely see how this would have been a dead-end situ situation later. Because there's some stuff that if you oh. if you get past a certain point without items, you're going to be screwed. Yeah, I remember. Like, I, I have played a few adventure games. And I, I actually can't play them because of those dead-end situations. And every time I go to play one, I keep getting reminded of why I don't play adventure games. Well, uh... You might like, and while they're not my personal preference, you might like, um, we'll say, some later adventure games or LucasArts adventure games. Because that was mostly, well, maybe maybe, maybe I'm sim oversimplifying things, but between those two, Sierra was the one who was bad for the dead ends. LucasArts, yeah. not so much. I, the dead ends, okay, but I don't know. I find the Lucas ones, from what I understand, you can't really die in them, though. You can't, no. And that, that's kind of a big thing for adventure games for me because, I don't know, I, I, I like games where you could die. Like, I, if there's no consequence to your actions, if there's no tension, it it's not really a game then. It's more of just an experience. I completely agree. That's yeah. actually the reason why I put up with stuff like Dead Ends is because I would rather play a Sierra adventure game and feel like I'm actually on an adventure yeah. than... Uh, if I were to, you know, play another adventure game where I can't die, I just kind of feel like, oh, at this point, I'm yeah. just playing an interactive storybook. It's exactly. not really uh, like, an like, adventure. Like, even if you're just watching a movie, and 
if, if there was no tense situations inside of a movie, like if the characters were just walking around doing whatever until they got to the end, it would be a very boring movie. Yeah, I, I've played some uh, like newer adventure games that follow that philosophy of not killing the player, and it feels like a joke whenever I'm in a so-called dangerous situation because it's like the guys might, might be holding a gun. It's like, oh no, I'm gonna shoot you! I'm gonna shoot you! And then I'm like, oh, that's nice. I'll get up from my computer and go get a sandwich. Like I don't. There's no. There's no yeah. sense of urgency. Exactly. So, so. Uh, that that's why I tend to prefer the older ones. But um, I guess that'll kind of go into a little bit of what we were talking about, or what what we will be talking about later in the show. Um, Actually, have you tried Star Mazer? Star Mazer, no. Because that one looks pretty good. It looks like it kind of has like that Lucas kind of feel. Okay. But it's also a schmuck. What? Yeah. It, it's, it's a point-and-click adventure with bullet hell segments. Okay. Uh, I haven't played it yet, but it looks fantastic. Uh, what, what, what system is that for? PC. For PC, okay. It I will look at that. You said Star Mazer. I think that's what it's called. All right. Well, I'll, we'll look into that. We'll exchange notes after the show there, and okay. we'll take a look at that because that's that sounds interesting. Yeah, it's like it. It's like we took both of our philosophies and just smashed them into one. Sounds good. Yeah, uh, yeah. That sounds exciting. exciting. I'll, I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah, I just remember that. Just trying to think of adventure games I might actually like, and that actually sounds like something that may appeal more to the newer generation. I'll say. So, that, like, because, like, these old games, they're pretty hardcore. Like, people these days don't really have the patience for dead ends and... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would definitely say, we'll say older games like uh, like King's Quest III, uh, those those kind of adventure games, saving is almost a mechanic. It is a mechanic. You have to strategically save so that you can make it through things. It, it's, the, it's not just uh, a matter of getting through the story. It's learning how the story should be constructed and then using your saves to bounce around through time to put those things together. I think there's a King's Quest game on the NES that used a password system. King's Quest V was on the NES. It was a password system, right? I don't remember. If, I, it, if it was a password system, that would probably be the worst thing in the entire world. Yeah, that, that's... Because I, I... King's Quest V is a very beautiful looking game, but to see it on NES, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is such a terrible port. I, I, I want to play it just for kicks, but... Oh yeah. Uh, but speaking of, we'll say terrible things... I understand that you've also been playing some games that you would not rate as necessarily your favorite. It's it's an interesting one. I'm going back to a PlayStation title here. Um, I, oh, man, I don't even know where to begin with this one. So, when I was a kid, I remember bicycling around town during spring cleanup. People would just throw out all their like, old electronics and stuff. I love picking up computers and bringing them home. One day, I found a disc. It was a PlayStation Underground disc, you know, a demo disc. And it was, like, it was cool because it had a bunch of games I never even heard about on there. And I brought it home. I was like, wow! Popped in the PlayStation and I was playing a bunch of demos. And some of them were actually really cool. And I can't really remember what they were, except for one in particular, which I'll get to in a minute. But I brought the disc over to my friend's house and it was a sleepover. Sleepover! So, we popped it in his PlayStation, and there was a section for import, where they chose a game from Japan and put it on the demo disc, like a demo from a game from Japan, put it on the demo disc, to let us preview what might actually be coming overseas. Was it in Jap- Japanese? Or? Yes, the game was entirely in Japanese. That's cool, okay. Yeah. And that game was Tail Concerto. And I remember first seeing everything in that game. Like, the graphics were absolutely gorgeous. There is a very light atmosphere to the game. Like, the game is about dogs and cats on floating islands driving robots. It had a very Mega Man Legends feel to it. I was going to say, this yeah, is, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's it, furry Mega Man Legends. It, that's exactly it, probably. Like, And because it was, a, it was a demo, it lets you see the first part of the game. And at the time, it played well. I remember it playing well. Maybe I'm just not very good anymore, but more on that in a second. Um, it was very charming, like... Your robot suit, like you were a police dog in a robot suit that had like flaily chain arms and you ran around and you just, like you're chasing little cats and their eyes get big and they freak out and they run around and you're shooting bubbles at them because like a bubble gun. Sure. Like, yeah, it, sure, it's awesome. It, it, it was a total kid's absolute dream at the time. Like I was a kid at the time, right? I wasn't even in high school yet. So it was an absolute dream for a kid to 
see this on the screen and be able to play it. Like, it was just like those Saturday morning cartoons. Cute animals, robots, colorful yeah. environments. Exactly. Yeah. Floating islands. Like, you can't, you couldn't go wrong with this game. And I remember seeing this game in stores when I was a kid. And I was too scared to actually get a copy of it. What, you scared it was going to bite you, or...? No, because at the time, like, everybody in the house was, like, playing Medal of Honor and Call of Duty and junk, so I, I, di- I didn't want to be unmanly, you know? Oh, it's, so, it's, it's kind of yeah. like the pressure a lot of, like, Nintendo gamers have yeah. now, where they're like, uh, I don't want to talk yeah. about playing Mario. Yeah. Because it's not cool. So, I remember, I decided to be a dirty, dirty, sneaky pirate. <gasps> Yar! Yar. And this was early 2000s, so at the time, BitTorrent wasn't exactly uh, the fastest. Was it... Did you get it through BitTorrent? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was like, early 2000s. I'm like, I think I was still... Yeah. Because I, 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 I did a little bit of that <laughs> yeah. back then, but I was using stuff like WinMX yeah. and Kazaa. Yeah. Anyways. So, I, I I downloaded the game. It took me over a month at 99%. So, <laughs> at 99%, I was just waiting, and on Thanksgiving Day, it finally finished. <laughs> yeah. Derek, was, what, what, Derek, what are you thankful for? I'm thankful doing? for my illegal copy of Tale <laughs> Control. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I earned this. <laughs> I earned this. All the money I could have made during that time to buy an actual copy. <laughs> well, you were a kid. Yeah, well, I was a kid. Well, were so, you a kid? Yeah, I was a kid. I couldn't afford my own games. I didn't even have my own games well, yet. There you go. Yeah. So if anyone's like getting mad at me right now for copyright and stuff, I did eventually buy a copy. I just want to throw that right now. Oh, right now. But um, isn't that why you've been playing it recently? Exactly. <laughs> so I remember popping the game in and I'm being so excited and. It's got English voice acting, and it kind of, you know, it's not what I expected because the Japanese demo I played had Japanese voice acting, and it was a lot more charming, and now I knew what was going on in the game, and I don't know. It, it didn't really strike the same chords, but I kept trying to make myself believe, oh, this, this game is awesome because it's exactly I remember it. And then three hours later, the game was done. I beat the entire game. Okay. And I was like, oh, that was the entire experience. Okay, uh, I like that game. You know, I just kept trying to make myself believe it was a great game. And then years later, I decide I'm going to revisit this game. So I look on eBay, and it's like $180 Canadian. Damn. And I'm like, um, no. <laughs> and then I found a PAL copy, which was completely in French, by the way, because it was only released in France and PAL territories, and it was much cheaper like over a hundred dollars cheaper so i grabbed that and i popped in my system and uh i didn't even finish it no no it, it's the french was too much for you actually no I, <laughs> I... <laughs> no actually i would say it's the definitive version of the game oh really yeah but i'll get to that uh, get actually that's actually a big uh, topic i want to get into after why i explain the game is terrible controls <laughs> we peeked up there. <laughs> okay. What kind of a lunatic makes a 3D platformer where there's an unused button on the controller and you can't press a button to snap the camera to the back of your character? So you're always facing the front wondering where you're shooting your bubbles. Why? So it's it's like Zelda without having the R, yeah, or the Z. I can't. I, I, whichever Z. I just, think it was Z. At this point, it just comes yeah. instinctively, so I don't yeah. I don't remember what button it is. Yeah, when, exactly. Yeah. But like, oh my goodness, it's got the worst camera ever. Like the game is so easy, but the camera makes it the hardest thing possible. Oh. It is like the enemies are a joke. You walk in like you walk in a room and there's like. You know, two robots there and a bunch of cats running around. And the robots just kind of stroll around the room and you shoot the robots 20 billion times because that's how many hits it takes. And then it finally explodes and you catch a cat in it. Go to the next room. It's the exact same formation. Go to the next room. It's the exact same formation. There's no variation. It's just... But you know what the game does have? Hard mode, evidently. Yeah. It's got story. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of story. Metal Gear Solid levels of story? Maybe. Whoa. Like, maybe not. But uh, <laughs> Let's go a little bit far. Like, the game, like, and that's my big point. 
they focus so much on the story environments they forgot to make a game. That charm that I got when I was a kid, it didn't last until my adulthood. You know, it it's not a timeless game like Mario or something where the gameplay actually is actually reinforces everything else. The game sucks. Don't buy it for the price it's going for. It's not a hidden gem. Don't let anyone believe you that. Believe? Make you believe that. <laughs> it sucks. Tail Concerto is terrible. But there's so much story, and the story sucks too. Like, everything about this game is... It's like it has so much potential, but it went the oblivion route of having everything voice acted. So the content was cut short, and it's a very linear path, and it's there's no exploration. It's, now, you said it was cut short. Was it, like, is that an actual thing? Like, Development-wise, was it cut short because of, like, budget or something, or is it just... Oh, no, it's just, I don't know, to be honest. I just know that they focused too much on the story and not the gameplay. So the gameplay was... Uh... I think the game did spend two years in development, and it does not show. No? I'm wondering, um, because you had said your first time trying it was in Japanese, so you didn't understand a thing. Exactly. So for all you knew, like, all you really had to go by was maybe, we'll say, the um, the uh, the enthusiastic or the, the way the lines were delivered in Japanese, so you could sort of get the idea of how, what they were saying, not necessarily what they were saying, but how they were saying it, kind of the emotion that they were conveying, and then whatever you were playing. So maybe in a way you kind mm-hmm. of built it up in your head as to, you know, how, how good it was. I actually want to touch on that. Um... It's, I'm going to throw it into a completely different ballpark here, but it is still somewhat related. It has nothing to do with the actual voice acting. I think it was a waste, to be honest, because the French version, the FMV cutscenes mm-hmm. are in Japanese with French subtitles. Okay. All the in-engine voice acting was removed altogether, so you only got text. And because it was only text, I was able to put the voices in my, uh, like, do the voices in my own mind. And it was actually a lot better of an experience for me. Hmm. I actually enjoyed just reading the lines myself. Like, even though it was in French, I still understood enough where I could actually... Actually, it was a really good translation. I could actually get the emotions oh. and everything from the characters. But, um, yeah, I actually preferred it without the voice acting. It's it's kind of like, like books and maybe one of the reasons why I, uh, I, I love Morrowind so much is that you can... You, you look at the text and you can sort of... Uh, apply your own yeah. idea of what that person sounds like to it. Yeah. So yeah. I think if they would have just done that from the start and focused more on bigger world, I think the game would have been... And, and you know, of course, a camera button. Yeah. <laughs> like, you cannot see anything at all in the game. Uh, but Now, we we actually kind of glossed over it a little bit. Um, you, you had mentioned we, we kind of got the idea, you know, you're it's a linear game where you're, a, what, a dog and a robot? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the kind of the, the ga- like gameplay loop? Is it basically just moving from room to room, shoot things until a uh, cutscene, and then keep moving? Pretty much. Oh, okay. Just, just wanted to make sure I understood yeah. that. There was, there was no, like, hub to it. Like, we compared it a little bit to Mega Man Legends. Well, so. there there is an overworld, but it is extremely linear. Like, you, you obviously know where to go, because places the next place doesn't open up until you finish a previous place. Gotcha. And it's all linear. There's also some parts that were kind of like, eh, they, I feel like they weren't even fully realized. Like, there's a cool part where you get a jetpack, and you can fly around, but okay. there's absolutely nothing in that level. You literally just fly from island to island. So, there, yeah, there's no point. To, there to was, the like, jetpack. it was a huge waste. Like, waste of potential, that is. Kind of reminds me of um, uh, Serious Sam 3, uh, that the very, uh, spoilers, uh, at the very last boss, you get a jetpack. And you're jumping and flying and bouncing all over things and shooting things from the air. And it's kind of like, man, I would have gone for a few levels like this. That yeah, would have exactly. been cool. That would have exactly. been really cool. It, w- it just felt like, yeah, it's something really underutilized. Yeah, underutilized. Yeah. Great potential, just they didn't realize it. It's a shame, really. Yeah. I really wanted to like it. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of games where I, it's like, I want to like it. It's like you try hard to like. I've heard some people say that that's a ridiculous statement. It's basically saying, "Well, of course you want to want to like a game, you got it." But when I when I when people say they want to like a game, I think it's more so the case that they're trying to say that they were trying to like it. They they were yeah. forcing themselves to really really give it that shot to uh, to to uh, 
to to like it even after you know they pretty much made up their minds like I don't like this but they're like you know what there's something about it that I want this to yep. resonate with me exactly and it just didn't yeah yeah so that's uh, I have a much bigger story but that's another time because I can rant about it and the rest of the games in the series all day long. <laughs> Hello, we are back to the podcast. <laughs> I just took the biggest leak of my life and I feel fantastic. I wasn't going to tell you when we took a break. I was just going to come into it naturally and just keep okay. going. So uh, I just like took a whiz during the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so he just dials it down. <laughs> All right, we're, off, we're back from the break, which you guys are now aware of. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I guess uh, I guess the conversation has been thrown back to me. Yep. So, what kind of nasty, terrible games that you have been playing lately, Jason, that you just want to get out there and have somebody listen? Like, I'm sure there's got to be some sort of dramatic experience that you have been just brewing in your mind. How you just want to take a dump all over it. It would probably be better to brew that in your digestive system, to be honest. But man, I was I was just watching him like I'm waiting. I'm like, I'm like I want to see how far he's gonna go with this. He's really gonna sell it. <laughs> um, well, there's one game I played recently that I absolutely was disappointed in and thought it was a giant turd. But I don't want to talk about it here. And because... <laughs> it's okay. It's gonna be okay. I don't want to talk about it, man. I'm seeing a group. Uh, no, <laughs> it was uh, the um, the Odd Gentleman and the, the New Sierra were, were basically redoing the King's Quest series, and it's, it's actually the whole reason I played King's Quest three. Uh, and they released Chapter four recently, and that was terrible. Uh, but since I already talked about King's Quest, maybe I'll save this for the next show. Okay, that's fine. That's fair. So the next one is more of a game that I'm kind of mildly disappointed with. Okay. I don't really have a whole lot to say about it, but basically I've uh, I've been playing Assassin's Creed 2. Ah, when a title's got two asses in it, <laughs> you know you're in for a bad time. <laughs> oh, dear goodness. <laughs> so, anyways, <laughs> uh, I, I had finished playing the first Assassin's Creed, which I actually thoroughly enjoyed. So I said, you know what, hey, um, I played the fourth one, Completely in French. So I guess we've got a bit of a theme here that, you know, we play games in French. And we, we actually thought, I actually had a very positive experience with Assassin's Creed 4. That was my oh. first, that was my first uh, foray into the series. Because I was wondering, like, well, how would I get into Assassin's Creed? And so people said, number four is amazing. So I played number four. I played it in French the entire way through. And I found the story a little bit um, hard to follow a bit, but that they used a lot of, let's say, little, We'll say some French that's a little bit over my head. Ah, uh, gotcha, yeah. So, actually, it helps if you, like, play a game with a French-English dictionary beside you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been doing that. I, I did look up some of the words. It did yeah. help. Like, that's part of the reason why I wanted to do it. I wanted to sort of immerse myself and yeah. try to work on that. But uh, I enjoyed the game itself anyway. So, I enjoyed that. So, I was like, all right, you know what? This seems like a series I might enjoy. So, I went back and I played the first Assassin's Creed. And I actually really enjoyed that one, too. I liked the approach they took uh, with that game. Uh, and then I got to Assassin's Creed 2 after I beat the first one. And a lot of people swear by it. They say number two is this amazing, this is like the definitive Assassin's Creed experience. And I've been kind of having a hard time, like sometimes, you know, when you, when you play a game, you don't yeah. want to put it down, right? Yeah. Where this one here, it's like, I'll play it, but then I'm like, okay, I'm done after like a little bit. It's it's a game where I'm, I'm sort of, in, I'm enjoying so, but it's not holding, like, keeping a grip on me, really. So number two is a number two. And number two, m maybe not quite a number two. It was more like the fart that pre okay. precedes the, the number two. <laughs> um, and I, if you're not familiar with the Assassin's Creed games, you know, I've, we've been talking about this for a little bit, uh, but uh, Assassin's Creed is kind of like a third world, uh, third world. <laughs> third world? It's a third world. <laughs> It's a free roaming third world simulator. <laughs> Whoa! That actually does sound cool. Sorry. It's a third person um, parkour action game, I would say. And uh, it takes place in Africa. <laughs> well, no, actually, number two takes place in Italy. Uh, but, you know, uh, contrary to what the title of the game would have you to believe, there's no stealth element to the game. 
you basically, it's like you're an assassin <clears throat> who decides that he's going to dress up in the most <clears throat> conspicuous looking clothing he possibly can, jump on top of rooftops, and try to sneakily kill their targets. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> like, I was playing Doom last night and I assassinated a lot of demons. I don't think it's quite the same thing, but oh. Doom is probably a better game. <laughs> yeah, well, what's better than Doom? Uh, I would say Morrowind. Uh, yeah. yeah I would. More on that at six. <laughs> but anyways, um, I find Assassin's Creed 2. Um, basically, you're, you're, you're climbing up buildings, jumping on rooftops, uh, you're doing little side missions and stuff. Now, in the first game... I found I kind of understood what was going on more because before you went and killed a target, there was like investigation missions. You okay. would eavesdrop and listen to, you know, people talking. Uh, you would like steal maps so you'd be able to know where the guards would be posted so you can sort of plan out your approach of when you're going to get to your target. Um, like stuff like that. And you kind of understood, okay, why you want to kill this guy. You know, you yeah. while you're investigating, you're like, you find out this guy is selling slaves in the black market and stuff like that. So you, you really learn that these people are despicable. And then when you finally got them, you'd have a short chat with them. And a lot of times what they would say would make sense. So the games did a really good job of kind of making things very gray where you were kind of like, well, am I on the good guy's side? Like what exact am I? Who, are these people really evil? Like, are we evil? And it did a really good job of that. So you were questioning, you always knew why you were doing what you're doing. Yeah. But, as someone who's never played an Assassin's Creed game, that actually sounds really good. Yeah, I, I'm like I might be overselling it because it can get a little redundant when you're doing the yeah. same things over and over. And I, I don't want you to get the wrong idea and be like, "Yeah, the game is amazing." But yeah, I, I, that's what I liked about it. Okay. Uh, but Assassin's Creed Two seems to have taken a page from like, uh, we'll say modern game design, where it's like follow the quest marker. Uh. So basically, it was basically. Instead of, you know, doing these investigations and going, okay, this guy here I got to take out, I basically get a short, like, 30-second cutscene of some guy saying, all right, this guy's a douche, you need to go kill him. And then it's like, all right, there you go, there's a quest marker, go do it. And if you deviate, you can, it's, you know, guy's out of range, guy's out of range, or something happens, and it's like a failure. And it feels a lot more like it's holding my hand and it's pushing me to go kill these guys, and I don't even fully understand why. In Assassin's Creed... Uh, well, you have to go kill them because they're douches, obviously. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Assassin's Creed 1, I felt it did a good idea of letting you know who the villain was. Yeah. They developed the, the, the guys you were going to be killing as characters. They weren't just a target. Whereas in Assassin's Creed 2, I don't even understand the story anymore. I just, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm killing this guy. Oh yeah, I need to collect these things because the game's yeah. telling me to do so. And it wouldn't be so bad if I could look back, like, in the menu and look at maybe a synopsis of what had happened up to now, and then I could kind of figure things out. But I feel like Assassin's Creed 2, it's like they were trying to go for a, more of a story-driven uh, approach, and yet, as a result, they did a poor job with the story. That's the worst. What When the focus of a game is story... And it's the worst aspect of the game. Yeah, it's it's it, it it destroys a game. Yeah, like mechanically, I would say it improves on the first game in like every way. Like okay. it's, it's 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 really it's nice it's 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 well done mechanically. I like that um, your health doesn't regenerate to full all the time. Like like if you get hurt, you're basically you have um, imagine it kind of like Zelda. Okay. Where you've got you know hearts, except in this one here you have diamonds. Okay. And if you get hit like a, a minor blow it'll sort of knock that down to like a not really a half diamond but it's like a dimmed sort of diamond and that if you're not hit again for a little while will sort of regenerate on its own okay but if you take like a full diamond of damage you actually need like a recovery item or to find like a medicine man or something to actually heal those wounds and uh i found that you know some of the assassin's creed games like uh, for example number four i found ridiculously easy because i could uh, it basically was like call of duty syndrome right or oh or, or halo syndrome uh, uh, from the later halo games basically oh hide behind cover health's back all right i'm going back to kill everything and i i do appreciate uh the mechanics of number two i do feel like um there's that tension i'm like crap i'm running low on health okay i do have healing items like the game's still not hard but i do like it when you know, a game will challenge you at least. Yeah. 
Yeah. Gotta have a challenge. Like we were talking about earlier, if there's no consequence, if there's no challenge, why? It's just an experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, I don't really have too much more to say about Assassin's Creed, so I think what we're going to do is go for an actual, uh, we'll say, uh, uh, the podcast break. This is the uh, official announced one. So and I get to take a dump now, too. That's right. You, oh, can, take right. A, you can take your <laughs> Assassin's Creed number two. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then uh, when we get back from uh, the break, we're going to be talking about the influence and the effect of stories uh, on games. Hmm. Brought to you by Space Cat. Perfect. Welcome back to this side of the break. We are back with the podcast that we are currently doing. The one that we talk on about video games and such. Yes, and I am back with a coffee so I can talk less robotic now and talk about video games with much enthusiasm. Ironically, you're speaking a little bit more, more robotic than you were before. Affirmative. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, the topic uh, for this, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure exactly how often we're going to be doing this, but for this particular episode will be how, I guess, I guess we'll just say yeah. how we feel stories should kind of take a backseat. Yeah, I guess so. Like, we want to talk about stories in video games and how it, how people over, they over, not ex- Overemphasize on them. Overemphasize, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I would agree, because story, uh, like, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any story at all. Oh, no. Like, uh, I I definitely feel like there is a place for um, story within a game, uh, but I don't feel like the story should be as big of a focus as it tends to be. I don't think it's so much of how big of a focus is, but it's how it's focused on. Okay, that's good, yeah. Yeah, because... You can have a game like Morrowind, which has a huge story, but it doesn't force it on you. You can do whatever you want. But the story is there to drive the world. But the mechanics, I would actually argue, kind of gar- drive the world even more so. Yeah, so. but it's the whole exploration aspect and how every NPC in the game has their own story. And it it, it because the game is an exploration game with combat elements, but it is mostly an exploration game, the story is actually useful here, but it's not the main focus of the game. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. in the case of, like, uh, uh, for example, a game like Morrowind, yeah, the story is kind of there to build lore in a way. It kind of, it's yeah. kind of there to give you some direction rather than just dropping you into, you know, some random world uh, and saying, okay, this is a farm. It actually tells, it, it go, dies a little bit deeper. It's more like the story is interweaved into yeah. the uh, the whole experience rather than being uh, something that... It's basically a story on top of a game rather than a game on top of a story. Exactly. Exactly. And I think they masterfully done it. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. Another example, uh, maybe maybe not quite, we'll say to the same sort of degree as far as free roaming, but wh- when I think of stories and, uh, you know, how they're implemented in games well, I kind of like... I kind of like Mass Effect. Mass Effect, I haven't tried it yet, but it does look really interesting. It's it's good in the, the way that they, um, even though it is kind of a linear story, yeah. it's kind of got this element where the story has mechanics to it. So it's like the story has different points where you can change the path that, uh, you know, you're going down, uh, you know, through various decisions that you make that will ch- change, you know, branches of the, of the story later. So it's not like it, it's totally free form. Um, but you know, the, the fact that you, you know, you're not just sitting there watching a cutscene. A lot of times you'll be watching the cutscene and then a choice comes up. It's kind of like one of those, uh, choose your own adventure books. Yeah, exactly. Those were actually fun. Yeah. And in some of the cases, the choices actually have no bearing on what plays next or very little bearing. So it's not like every choice you make, matters but the fact that the choices are there um you know even on those little things it keeps you involved it adds a little flavor it adds a little flavor yes and that's 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 an instance where i feel like um the gameplay is very prevalent and it's even though i'm enjoying the story i feel like i'm involved in what's being said 
that's the most important part, actually being involved and not just following along for the ride. Yeah, exactly. So that, that actually sounds great. I actually did want to try Mass Effect, and knowing that, yeah, maybe I will try it out soon. I don't like Origin, though. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I find uh, nowadays stories are just too forced. Like, I, I, I played, I'm not really a big modern shooter fan, but I played um, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, number one, like the first Modern Warfare. And the gameplay itself was actually really good. Like, the gunplay felt fine, and, yep. you know, I actually really liked it, except, like, I didn't get to try the multiplayer. So my experience was a single player. And the developers, they, they they want to, like, go total movie, right? Yeah. They want, like, the big budget. They want, you know, the voice acting. They big, want... The big set pieces. Big set pieces, yeah. And, you know, it was just one event after another, after another, after another. But I didn't feel like I was actually part of the story. It just felt like just a series of events. I didn't even know what was going on. Actually, I don't even know what the storyline was, to be honest. Like I played through the entire game. I actually beat the game, and I don't know what the storyline is. Yeah, I've got. I played yeah. it too, and I I, I, I yeah. struggled to figure out what yeah. uh, what's going on. It kind of reminds yeah. me of uh, I think I, like what I mentioned earlier yeah. about Assassin's Creed Two. Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess you could make an argument that maybe it's a story done poorly, not necessarily the fact that the story ruined it. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. <laughs> um. Yeah, it, it was probably done poorly because, like, it, it kept jumping around and sometimes there were some missions where you go back in time, like, a bunch of years, like, like it was a flashback. And okay. Even that was kind of confusing and disjointing. It was completely unnecessary, you know? Like, why don't they just make a full game about going back in time? Oh, they did! It's called the original Call of Duty! <laughs> It's it's interesting when we talk about this though because you all, you've got to sort of narrow down and find out exactly what is the problem because we can go ahead and say it's you know it was the story in Call of Duty but in a way it could be that they emphasized so much the mechanics that they didn't care about the story so in, in a yeah. way I could actually say that Call of Duty, Duty would be uh, a case for why stories should be done well in games actually yeah it, it yeah yeah. I did want to bring up some examples of games that I've been playing for like tens of years now and I still don't know what the storyline is, but they've just been so fun that I keep playing them, but I never actually thought of that, like considered that before. Is that if, if it's a, if, if it's a, but then again, then again, doing a well done story, you know, from the other perspective, yeah, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate on both ends here. Yeah. I'm, I'm still kind of got me the, thinking now. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, to do a story well in a game, that's an art. That's also part of making sure that the gameplay shines. Exactly. So, you know, if uh, you, you took a Call of Duty, let's say if we did a good story where you understood everything that was happening, would it make it that much better of a game? I think so, because, because it's the way it's presented to you, right? Okay. Like the whole focus I was talking about earlier. It's the way it's presented to you. And that presentation could affect the story too, I find. Because the game, it felt like I was just just that, another soldier on the field. Like, I just felt like I had absolutely no impact on anything. But if the story was done better, they would have made everything matter better. It, it, it's hard to describe. I can't really describe it. Like, you're looking at me weird right now. But... <laughs> um, well, it's because it's because yeah. I'm trying trying to figure it out, but uh, I'm also trying to think at the same time as well. So I'm yeah. I'm trying to, yeah. It's like so we had an idea of what we wanted to say coming into this, and then we start talking, and then yeah. you know we're asking questions, and we start going, well, maybe you know, looking at it from yeah. the other perspective, and I think that's useful, being able to yeah. look at things from uh, various perspectives. Yeah, because I, agree. I don't want uh, people hearing this and thinking that I'm just trying to you know crap all over story. Story, there's no room for story in my games. Uh, when that's not the case, um, I've actually played some completely linear games uh, where it's basically just been all story some um, Undertale you play I, I have not played Undertale yet oh maybe maybe we shouldn't touch Undertale lest the fan base become enraged I have a lot of things to say about Undertale we'll leave that for another time alright well yeah. we will cover Undertale perhaps on a future show it, it was it was a good story but I th actually, you know what? No, let's talk about Undertale. Okay. 
Okay. It, it, it actually had a good set of characters, good story and everything. But you hear, here we go. We're going to fill in that example of a good story, but the game is weak because of how linear it is. It was a very linear experience. Even though you could take, like, even though there were multiple choices, it was so linear, it left no room for exploration for that genre. Like, it's an RPG, right? Okay, yeah. So I think, as far as story goes, it's also important to look at the expectations for the genre that the story is in. Huh. You know, this is actually, this is really interesting because uh, we seem to be, t- uh, you know, you brought up li- a linearity, and then you brought up, like, a, like a negative uh, connotation. When one of your favorite game genres is an on rail shooter, right? The the shmups. Yep, I so, absolutely adore bullet hell shooters. So it's kind of funny how it's not just us either. I, I hear a lot of people online talk like this about like linear is used as like this negative term. I think, like I said, the expectations. If you're going for a deep world with a lot of lore and story, you expect there to be some flexibility because you're trying to live in another place with a completely different set of people. It's not a quick thrill. It's it's like a full supper, a full meal, instead of just a quick snack. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I can see that. Yeah. Um, my thinking is, though, that, you know, we're talking, what if that's not the intention of the, the original creator, though? They want to tell a story, okay. Yeah. And there's nothing inherently wrong with a linear game. Like, I, yeah. I play a lot of really classic games. Like, nobody's going to... Actually, I, I, that's a bad example. I was going to bring up Super Mario Brothers, but there's secret exits and warp yeah. zones, so it's... It, that it's, game's awesome. It's kind of not linear, but uh, in a way, it is a very linear experience in a way. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting that we kind of equate linearity to mean bad, but it's often mm. when in conjunction with story. Yes, it's the focus I was talking about. So maybe it's... Yeah, like, like, actually, like you said, the focus, the developer's focus on wanting to give you this very particular experience. Yeah. So maybe it's not the st- maybe it's not story itself. It's more so I mean, we might need to rename this the, the whole topic of this podcast because <laughs> I think we're kind of getting to the root of it. I think it's when the developer is trying to we'll say impose their vision on yes. you you get this very uh you, you feel oppressed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because everyone has a different everyone gets something different from anything. Everyone's got different tastes. Yep. People who listen to music, they like some people like bass where they can't even hear the music anymore. Some people Don't actually be- like hearing the music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about the bass. Uh, yeah. But um yeah, one of my favorite games of all time is Dead on Patch Daljo. And yeah. I absolutely love this game. Like I cranked the difficulty to max. And it has the stupidest storyline of any video game I could possibly think of. Like in the previous game, like because it's it's the fourth game of a series, and what type of game is that? It it is a bullet hole shooter. It is a vertical shooter. You have your ship on the screen, and you have to dodge millions of bullets, and you have like a tiny hitbox, and you shoot back and whatever. But there's a lot of gameplay mechanics in there. But I'm not gonna touch that just yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's hard to understand what uh, kind of game you're yeah. talking about here. So it is a very fun game. Actually, you know what? I will touch on the mechanics. Basically. It has a combo system. It has bombs, hypers. Basically, if you combo a certain amount of enemies, you get more points because it adds as a multiplier to how many points you get from each enemy. That's crucial to getting extra lives, which you definitely need in this game <laughs> because it's one-hit death, right? And there's millions of bullets everywhere. It's actually regarded as one of the hardest games ever created. So it's, it's, like, it's yeah. like Galaga on steroids. Galaga, like if... It, it's main breakfast, dinner, lunch, everything with steroids. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd like yeah. to have some steroid loaf, please. Mm, yum. Oh, made from meat. Products? Yes. I, <laughs> I was going somewhere with that, but I don't remember where. Anyway. Something to do with meat and steroids. But anyways, um, so it's a fantastic game. And what I get out of it, and I don't focus on the story because I'll explain why in a second, is I love actually solving the stages because it's it's a game with the exact same stages every time the enemies come up on the same spots they have very similar enemy uh, not enemy bullet patterns every time and I love analyzing each stage and going okay this enemy comes from here if I line myself up on this pixel <laughs> yes I'm very precise here um, I'll be able to you know chain these enemies while avoiding these bullets and you eventually make a full path through a level and that's actually a very satisfying experience for me 
the storyline is in the previous game you're blowing up these enemies and then your commander tells you oh you were blowing up your own enemies the entire time this is a plot to take over the world ha 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 you were blowing up your own enemies yes because the enemies were actually your squad mates yeah you said you were blowing up your yeah. own enemies yeah I know okay but, yeah. So, so you're blowing up your own yeah, squad mates. You blow up your own squad mates, and then you're told this, and you're like, man, I'm so angry. So it's Team Killer the game. I'm so angry. <laughs> so you blow up your squad mates again in the second <laughs> loop. And it makes no sense whatsoever. But you eventually like save the world by like reducing overpopulation anyway, so it's all good. <laughs> So in the in the next game, that's actually legit. That's actually what happens to the story. But we got a solution, guys. Yeah, just kill everyone. Okay. So in the next game, they take the bad guys and they send them to the moon, <laughs> and then make them sleep. And on Earth, everything is all good. So they make robot hookers for everyone. <laughs> Wait, are you seriously? Yes, this is legit. Okay. But there's a deep dark plot. The robot hookers are made out of real people. <laughs> So wait, are they are they actually robots then? They're half robot hookers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the people on the moon wake up and start producing weapons again. So you have to take your personal robot hooker with you and go blow them all up. <laughs> okay, so we grab the I'm, I'm robot. Not, I'm not, yeah, I'm go not even kidding. The The ending of the game is your character being strangled to death by your personal hooker going crazy, and then they turn into the bad guy in the next game. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so, let me get this straight. So, basically, you decide to go on a team-killing spree, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. after that, you get yourself a cyborg hooker, Yeah. and then you go and blow up Space Australia, Yeah. and then they neon Genesis Evangelion you at the end yeah. by strangling. Yeah, and then they turn into the final boss in the next game. And, and like, I've been playing this game for years, and I've ignored the story, and I've had a heck of a fun time. I love this game with a passion. I just pretend the story is not there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's important that you can do that. Exactly. Because the story is not forced on you. That's actually what killed the series later on when they did force a story, and it was very bad. Like, I've, I've ranted about this before, uh, for, like, for other games, even we'll say less obscure and very less Jap Japanese games than that. <laughs> uh, but, like, you know, unskippable cutscenes are one of the greatest sins, I think, that uh, a developer can ever commit. Uh, yeah. Forcing you to watch the story. You know, tutorials kind of fall into there because they sometimes sprinkle some story into the tutorials. But basically, making the story so that it is stopping you from playing, it's, 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 it's terrible. Like, it is. Like, if, if you don't care about the story, you just love the gameplay, you can just go ahead and skip that. And I like that when games allow you to skip because, um, I think it was Borderlands. I actually played Borderlands and I skipped everything. I paid attention. To, I didn't even know what the story was. I was just, I'm like, I'm just running around shooting people. This yeah, is fun. It is fun. And I'm like, uh, you know, I'll probably have to go back and play it again and find out the story later. But I, I really, I didn't care. I, there was, there's a quest marker and I just, I was playing it like a regular shooter. To be fair, the uh, dialogue is actually pretty. Oh, well, then I, I guess I'll have to give it give it a chance. But I was just in the mood for a shooter. Yeah. I didn't want to sit there and read. I didn't want to listen to anybody. I just wanted to shoot things. Well, it's great that the game actually allowed you to do that, even if it was story heavy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that I would say that's an example of what I think uh, is a good game, what you should be able to do. Like, I'm not saying we get rid of stories. I just say make sure that the stories are not infringing. You know, the, yeah. this, the, this developer vision is... Like, I get that they have a vision. They want, you know, to put out a game out there, and they want to put out a story, and they want people to have a very specific a very specific experience, but that takes away half the magic of gaming, which is yeah. that interactive element. Exactly. You know, it's... You, you don't see that in sports. Exactly. Like, what What if, like, you're playing baseball one day, and then all of a sudden, like, a cutscene happened, where, like, the enemy team were, like, plotting to take over the world while you're trying to, like, swing a bat at a ball. Yeah, like I don't, I don't need some exposition between like periods in like hockey. Exactly. Like it, it, like, it would turn into wrestling. Exactly. <laughs> actually, that's a great comparison. Yeah, actually, <laughs> holy cow! Modern games are like wrestling. Except wrestling is pretty awesome. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, wrestling. Yeah, wrestling is great. <laughs> but that, that's the kind of thing. It's like, all right, we're here to see stuff. And instead, we get to watch people scream at each other for like 30 minutes, and then finally get to the action. Yeah. 
Exactly. However, there are some sports games where they did put in stories like Captain Tsubasa, which is a series of soccer games that are very anime and have a lot of dialogue during the uh, during the matches. And... But that's a sport. It's a, it's a game about a sport. Yeah. So is it really the same thing? Maybe. It's kind of, kind of that sort of, I don't know, video I, game exception. I, I think they executed it perfectly because it wasn't just, you know, your game screen, and then you run around, and then all of a sudden it cuts to a completely different screen, and that was it. The entire screen is taken up by animations of the characters running with the small little map on the bottom of what's going on. So the main focus, focus is the key word here, yeah. is that whole story thing. And it, it tried to imitate, like, you know, anime, how everything's, like, over-exaggerated and stuff like that. It brought that to a video game sports game, and I think they did it right. Because, like, it has, like... The, your character's doing crazy super moves and everything, whoosh, flashy, colorful backgrounds, and if you're there for that sort of thing, you're gonna have an awesome time. So, yeah. So, and, yeah. and like in that game, is it easy just to get to the core gameplay though? Like, say you're like, uh, you said it's a sports game, right? What sport again was it? Soccer. Soccer. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. Or football. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, is it if let's say you just wanted to play soccer, could you load up the game and get into a soccer game rel- relatively quick, or is there like a lot of story parts between? The actual sports. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know? It's in Japanese. I watch videos of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it looks really cool. So you don't know if you can, like, skip this stuff? Did it, did, well, it was entertaining to watch even though I wasn't playing it, so that's important. All right. And and from what you saw, was it predominantly gameplay, or did, were there a lot of stories? Like, was it mostly story? It was mostly gameplay, actually. Okay. So... Like, like I said, you got the little map on the bottom and you can actually move your character how you want and stuff. And so, it, yeah, it, it seemed like, even though I don't understand Japanese, it seemed like it even had the elements of scripted things. But even though it still lets you freely move around. So it, was, it seems like it was a really well done game. It's available on the Famicom, Super Famicom. I think there was a Sega CD version too. Okay. Yeah, uh, because you were saying that, and I was thinking about that. Like, sometimes I'll be playing games nowadays, and um, because of story reasons, like, like say I'm doing one particular thing. I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, I don't know. I might be playing a game where I... I don't know. We'll just, we'll just make up some scenario where I have to go run around and shoot guys. It's a shooter, whatever. Yeah. Boom, boom. And then due to story reasons, eventually I get to a point where I can't do the boom, boom, where it's like, okay, you have no guns and I can get that. You know, you want to mix things up a little bit, but sometimes like I want to play a game for the boom, boom. Yeah. (laughs) And if I have to wade through an hour of something else before I can get back to the core mechanic, the thing that made up most of the game, uh, or you know, I'm fighting with it listening to story and I just want to get to the game like sometimes I don't have a whole lot of time to play a game exactly sometimes I just want to sit down shoot something and we'll say the, the more the game and the story of it sort of holds you back from doing that thing that you want to do I think that's kind of part of the part of a problem and that's yeah um it's kind of why I like we'll say maybe more I don't want to say more simple games but you know games where they don't change up the mechanics too often like, uh, I think I think changing up mechanics is not a bad thing if it lets you pick it from the start and it carries through throughout the entire game. Yeah, like yeah. a character select. Yeah, I would yeah. I would agree because I'm thinking like some examples to where you know you'd get to a level where there's like a turret sequence. Ugh. Or some, Ugh. or there's some games where you get to a place where you get to like drive something really cool, but then you can never redo that again. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I really like that. I want to replay that, and it doesn't. No, the you can't. Jet- the jetpack I was talking about earlier. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. The, the jetpack, the you yeah. know, underutilized elements. Yeah. But that's getting a little bit, we'll say, out of the realm of... Well, story impacts that a little bit. So, in, you know, in a way, I do like games where the levels are more compartmentalized, but at the same time, I don't know. It, it, it is a balance. It really is. It's a balancing act. Yeah. So, ultimately, I feel that, um, you know, sto- stories should be there to sort of establish the setting for the game. Like, uh, you even look back to, like, Donkey Kong. You could say that that has a story. (laughs) It does have a story. It's a pretty good one. (laughs) You know, basically... Monkey stole your girlfriend. There you go. (laughs) Monkey stole your girlfriend. Go get her back. And 
that's that's kind of the role I think stories need to have is they need to be they need to be there to establish the setting for which you are going to be performing mechanics. Yeah, it, uh, it gives you a reason for your actions. Yeah, I, I confuse a lot of uh, a lot of people who uh, who like adventure games because I don't like adventure games for the story. Okay, that's interesting. I actually the uh, I I like the the really old adventure games. I tend to like you know the the, like King's Quest one up to like actually I kind of like them all but I like the earlier ones the ones where with the text parser and stuff because those games there they were so limited they couldn't really gi- give you a lot of that story that exposition those fancy frames of the close ups of the characters yeah. and stuff they didn't have the memory and stuff and as a result a lot of the story was you playing the story you know okay if I if I was to retell the story of let's say Space Quest one. It would sound very boring. No, actually, you know, I I, I walked around the, the halls of the Arcada. You know, I, I there was the, there was a warning, you know, that, that we were being boarded. There was alien fo- uh, footsteps that I heard on the ship. You know, a okay. lot of a lot of my crewmates were dead. Um, <sighs> I need I needed to find a way off off of the, the Arcada. You know, I was searching bodies. I found a key card. Notice all this stuff. It's not delivered to me in exposition. This is my own experience. I am telling the story of what I experienced. The experience is the story. Holy crap! You're right. The experience is the story. That it's, should matter. It's the, the difference between a developer being the storyteller and the player being the storyteller. You're right. Boom! <laughs> Mind blown! <laughs> <laughs> so, I, there we go. I think that is my ultimate point. I, I think... I agree. That is probably my point, too. I think it's better when the player gets to be the storyteller. I agree. Me, too. That is that is a perfect note to like end this topic on i think we're good yeah we're, we're good <laughs> we're done um if you have any uh we'll say comments on we'll say the, the topic or anything we discussed today um i'm not sure exactly how you can uh, get get in touch with us i'll probably be putting this up on youtube as well as we'll say some i'm looking into the itunes and various other little say podcast locations so uh any way you can find us go ahead and reach us and i think actually on that note it's probably a good idea to go ahead and plug some Contact information. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I'll leave a link to my band YouTube account. <laughs> uh, all right. And uh, I will... I, yeah, I'll, well, I guess I'll leave a link to mine. Uh, you can go ahead and search for me, actually, on YouTube. It's blue screen underscore Jason, and it's uh, blue without an E. So it's B-L-U-S-C-R-E-E-N underscore Jason. You say, search that on YouTube, you'll find me. Uh, it's the same handle on Twitter. You can go ahead and find me on there, or... Um, all my information is actually on bluescreen.ca, spelt the same way. Uh, you go under contacts, it has my Twitter, email, whatever. You can go ahead and contact me there if you have any comments about the show. Uh, you have anything else, Dad? Um, hey guys, um, I'm single. <laughs> Wait, so- I said that to the guys. <laughs> oh crap! <laughs> uh, so you can send no! you can send your love letters and <laughs> notes of adoration to Derek. Ooh, I'll be waiting. <laughs> to uh, one of the, the places where we... Actually, I don't know. There's no information for him. You can send it to me. I'll make sure he gets it. Yeah. I don't have an account anywhere anymore. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about that next time. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. All right. Well, I uh, hope that uh, you've uh, enjoyed this uh, little, we'll say podcast um topics stuff and uh until next time i'd like to ask you all to game on man one time i was playing tetris and i flipped the block 720 degrees before it touched the bottom (laughs) that's what i'm talking about the experience man the experience so hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to the blue screen podcast i am your host jason and i am joined today by derek who i'm going to introduce for himself because he cannot be trusted with the microphone (laughs) (laughs) and we are here today to talk about video games i was about to say nipples the fox (laughs) nipples the fox it's my son cozy he's got four nipples Yeah, we need to redo this. (laughs) This is terrible. All right, we're back on the other side of the break. If you are not hearing impaired, then the ad did not hurt your ears. If it did, then you probably can't hear us and you probably should be turning this off. 
Wait, if you're not hearing impaired, it didn't hurt your Exactly, ears? something. Don't 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 overthink it. <laughs> okay. Don't question me. Don't question Big Brother. <laughs> Stop watching me. <laughs> Anyways, so today we wanted to uh, talk about we'll say the impact of the story has on games. Basically, what story has done for gaming. Story is a narrative form of narrative <laughs> that adds narrative to your game. When you add a narrative to your game, it is a game plus a narrative. <laughs> eloquently said. Eloquently said. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. I think we're done. We're done here. Yeah. All right. See you tomorrow. <laughs> All right. I'm going to carry on by myself because he, he decided to take off. Um, so I don't know where to start with this. So basically, um, I'm probably too far away from the microphone now because I yeah. actually went home. Yeah. Uh, hey, welcome back. Welcome back hey, to the show. Hey, hey, hey. Thanks, 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 bro. Thanks. Um, story in a video game. That's actually a very interesting topic. I think there is a place where story does work and a place where it doesn't work. All right. <laughs> it's our podcast. <laughs> I'm like, this is terrible. <laughs> Uh, uh, I should at least have a starting point for this. Yeah. I'm gonna, should I erase this or do we keep this outtake stuff? Yeah, maybe. All right, sure. Why not? Right. Wow! Welcome back from the break, everybody! I hope you had a fantastic time! I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Then we could uh, end this podcast now and uh, go play video games. <laughs> Sounds good. I'd rather be video gaming than podcasting. All right, later. Later, everyone.